Hi, Year 6. It's Mrs Withers with Chapter 20 of Room 13. When Fliss and Lisa got back, the teachers had already called everybody together for the return journey. It was only a quarter past three, but the mist had thickened and there was a hint of drizzle in it. Some of the kids were sitting on rocks, drying their feet with gritty towels, pulling on socks and boots. Others stood waiting with their hoods up and bags of pebbles dangling at their sides. A small party, supervised by Mrs Evans, was picking up the last scraps of litter. Bottom Top Middle prided itself on the fact that whenever a group of its children vacated a site, they left no evidence that they had ever been there. As they trudged up towards the path in the cliff, Fliss saw a large slate-coloured pebble lying on the sand. Something about it appealed to her. It's perfect oval shape, perhaps, or it's wonderful smoothness. She bent and picked it up. It was thick and far heavier than she'd expected. And when she tried to add it to the collection in her polythene bag, it wouldn't fit. She was cramming it into her anorak pocket when Mrs. E Mrs Evans, who was bringing up the rear, said, Felicity, you don't really want that, dear. It's far too big. You'll be crippled by the time you carry it all the way back to Whitby, not to mention the fact that it'll probably tear your pocket. Throw it away. Fliss was a quiet girl who never argued with her teachers, and so she surprised herself as well as Mrs Evans when she said, I like it, miss. I want to keep it. It was lucky for Fliss that Richard Varley chose that moment to leap on Barry Tune's back. As the two boys fell to the sand, Mrs Evans called sharply and hurried to separate them. And by the time she was done, st by the time she had done so, the line of children was toiling up the cliff path. She had to put on a spurt to catch up. The pebble incident was forgotten. The rest of the walk back was uneventful, except that it started to rain in earnest, which made the duckboard slippery. Several children fell to the delight of the rest, who laughed and cheered their class in their cheered their classmates' misfortune. By twenty to five, they were back at the crow's nest, drenched and happy. They were sent to their rooms to change and write up in their journals. It was during this interlude that Fliss and Lisa, Trot and Gary, met briefly on the fourth floor landing. We all set for tonight, asked Fliss. She felt tense and was amazed that for a few hours today she'd actually succeeded in forgetting all about this. The others nodded. Same time, same place, said Trot. And let's hope nothing happens. Any news of Ellie May? asked Lisa. Gary shrugged. I saw Mrs. Marriott going into her room as I came up. Maybe I'll call her. Pe Maybe they'll call her parents to take her home or something. Oh, I wish they would. Sighed Fliss. I'm fed up with feeling scared. Trot nodded. Me too. We all are, said Lisa. Who wouldn't be? After tea, everybody had to rest quietly for an hour in their rooms to let their food settle before Mrs. Evans took them swimming. Fliss couldn't rest. There was something she had to do. She looked out of the window. Yes, old Sal was there as usual, mumbling something about going to the toilet. Fliss left the room, slipped down the stairs and let herself out. It was still raining. The old woman looked up as the girl reached the shelter. Fliss smiled. Hello. Sal nodded. Evening. Fliss blushed, looking down at her feet. She didn't know what to say. I... I'm staying at the crow's nest. I... I know. I've seen you lots of times through the window. The crow nodded. Windows is the eyes of a house. Fliss smiled. Yes, eyes. Watching the sea. Lucky old house. Lucky? Something rattled in Sal's throat. You're wrong, child. It's got the other eye. See? The eye that sleeps by day. Oh, has it? Smith smiled, not sure whether she ought to. The eye that sleeps by day? Sounds balmy. But then, so does room 13. Should she mention room 13 to Sal? No. There wasn't time. It only needed a teacher to look in room 10 and she'd be in trouble. She looked at the old woman. I'd better get back. They'll be wondering... She let the sentence hang, turned and ran through the rain with her head down. 
Nobody had missed her. And when the swimming party set out 20 minutes later, old Sal had gone. The rain-lashed streets were practically deserted, and when they got to the pool, they found they had it almost to themselves. They made the most of it, leaping and splashing and whooping in the warm, clear water under Mrs Evans's watchful gaze. A puzzled frown settled for a moment on the teacher's face when she noticed four of the children standing by the steps at the shallow end, taking no part in the revelry. Odd, she mused. Very odd. You'd think they'd were non-swimmers or something, but they're not. Still, it's up to them, isn't it? Perhaps they're tired from the walk today. Her eyes moved on, and the frown dissolved. Chapter 21 Nobody called Ellie May's parents or took her home. The word was that she was a little better, and might even be with them on the coach to Robin Hood's Bay the following day. Fliss f wasn't fooled. At ten o'clock she was lying on her back, staring at the wire mesh under Marie's mattress, waiting for half past eleven. Her hands were folded across her, che her chest, and under them was the pebble from Saltwick Bay. She felt its weight when she breathed, and her fingers caressed its perfect soothing smoothness. She was tired, not from swimming. Neither she nor the other three had swum, but from the ex exertions of the day and a sleepless night before. The swimming must have finished off Marie and the twins, because they were zonked out already. She listened to their breathing and wondered if she could stay awake. She didn't, not completely. At least twice she drifted off and woke with a start, thinking she'd missed the witching hour, but there was to be no such luck. When the town clock chimed for 11.30, she was wide awake and scared. This time, she got to the bathroom first. Tross and Gary came nearly straight away, but it was 19 minutes to 12 when the door of room 11 opened and Lisa slipped out. Sorry I'm late. I fell asleep, she whispered. It's okay, Fizz told her. I fell asleep too. Twice. I don't spark out admitted Trot. This div had to shake me like a, a madman to wake me up. He looked at Gary. Didn't you guess? Gary nodded. You should have got yourself a stick of rock like mine. I sucked that from ten o'clock and I didn't nod off once. Dirty pig, shuddered Lisa. I don't know how you can. Gary grinned. You should see it. It's getting a real good point on it now. Tell you what, I do want to see tonight, said Fliss. I want to see how the 13 gets on the door. I want to be watching when the clock starts striking midnight. See the exact moment that number appears. Yeah, Trot nodded. Good idea. Let's do that. I've brought a torch, said Lisa. We can shine it on the door, right where the number will be. We'll see really clearly then. They waited. Gary, sitting on the rim of the bath, looked at his watch every few, few seconds. Fliss went to the hand basin, ran a trickle of cold water into her cupped hand and sucked it up, watching herself in the mirror. Trot stood by the window, gazing out. The patterned glass splintered the light from a street lamp. Lisa leaned on the wall by the door, switching her torch on and off. After a while, Fliss whispered, Maybe she won't come. It's only five, too, Gary told her. Plenty of time yet. He hoped Fliss was right. When his watch told him it was a minute to midnight, Gary get up, got up and went over to the door. The others joined him, jostling quietly so they could all see. And Lisa was at the front with her torch. Thirteen seconds, he hissed and began counting down. At 15 seconds, Lisa switched on and steadied the disc of light on the right spot. It was not spectacular, as Gary whispered. Zero. They heard the town clock chime, then strike. At about the fourth stroke, they noticed a small, shapeless mark on the door, and Lisa moved the torch slightly to get it in the centre of her beam. It was like a stain lighter than the surrounding woodwork. A stroke followed stroke. The Spain seemed to shrink and become paler, and then to divide 
becoming two whitish blobs whose shapes altered until by the twelfth stroke they formed the figures one and three as the echo died they heard a door close somewhere below i think she's coming warned fliss switch the torch off lisa she did so plunging the landing into darkness they withdrew and half closed the door again did you see that breathed trot it just came out of nowhere i can't believe it fliss snorted you've got to believe it you div you saw it the point is what do we do when ellie may gets here we stop her hissed gary by force if we have to we agreed okay but which of us actually goes out there and grabs her or do we all go lisa shook her head we can't all go i'd be scared we'd scare her to death it should be a girl fliss you or me but i think we should try calling her first from here Shh. Trot pressed a finger to her lips, to his lips. She's here. They looked out. Ellie May was standing on the top step, looking at the door to room 13. She hesitated for a moment and then moved forward. Lisa nudged Fliss. You are me. Me. As Ellie May drew level with the bathroom, Fliss cupped her mouth with her hands and hissed, Ellie May! The girl didn't turn or pause, but continued walking slowly towards the cupboard. Using her full voice this time, Fliss called out, Ellie May, over here! It made no difference. The girl was standing before the door now, reaching for the knob. Fliss felt a push in the small of her back, and Lisa hissed, Go on, for heaven's sake, before she opens that door! She left the bathroom and moved across the landing, approaching Ellie May from the rear. As the girl's hand closed around the knob, Fliss took a gentle grip on her shoulder and said, Ellie May, you don't want to go in there. She felt the thin shoulder stiffen under her hand. Ellie May's head turned slowly, and Fliss found herself gazing t into eyes which were as dead as a shark's. The girl's lips twitched. Let go of me, she hissed. Leave me alone. Ellie May! Fliss swung her round and held her by both shoulders. Listen, we're trying to help you. If you go in that room, you'll die. Ellie May snarled, shaking her head. Never die, never. You, not me. She tore herself from Fliss's grip and turned, scrabbling for the doorknob. Gary! cried Fliss. Lisa, quick, I can't hold her. There was a scampering of bare feet on carpet, and they were with her, the three of them. Hands reached out, snatching fistfuls of Ellie May's clothing, circling her wrists. She hissed and fought, amazingly strong, freeing one hand to twist the no doorknob and push. The door swung inward. Fliss, one arm crooked around Ellie May's neck, glanced inside and saw not a cupboard, but the room of her dream. There was the table with the long, pale box upon it, and beyond, a small, curtained window. A window which wasn't there in the daytime. The eye that sleeps by day. She dug her heels into the carpet, threw her weight backwards and fell with Ellie May on top of her. Quick! One of you, close that door! She flung both arms around Ellie May's waist and held on as the girl bucked and writhed. Lisa dropped to her knees grabbed Ellie May's legs and fell forward, pinning them under her. Fliss heard the door slam, and then the boys were there, catching the girl's wildly flailing arms. Ellie May fought on for a moment, but they were, they were too many for her. Fliss felt the thin body go limp, and the girl began to cry. When they let go of her, she lay curled up on her side, with a thumb in her mouth, moaning softly. They got up and stood looking down at her. What do we do now? asked Lisa. As she spoke, they heard voices below and footsteps on the stair. It won't be up to us, said Gary. Here comes the cavalry.